A lady in Washington, D.C., walks to the local metro station after receiving a text message, telling that she would get the answer she wants on crossing 1114. When she arrives, however, she finds nothing but death since a coming train kills her in seconds. Meanwhile, Max, an American computer engineer, is finishing off his final work in Thailand. After that, he returns to the hotel to prepare to return home, and he is astonished to discover a package waiting for him with no zender. Inside, he finds a brand new modern phone, but he has no clue what to use with it. Max decides to leave it for the time being and switches on the news, which is still debating the contentious security budget bill that would allow the NSA to update its present monitoring technologies globally. At that time, a message from an anonymous sender comes on Max's new phone, informing him that the hotel would be offering a half-price rate just this weekend. When Max inquires with reception, he receives confirmation that the promotion is valid, so he chooses to remain for two more days. At the same moment, a bald guy in Russia gets a text message informing him that another phone has been spotted. During the weekend, Max relaxes and has fun while still keeping up with the news, which allows him to learn that the bill did not pass due to a single vote, despite the fact that NSA director and bill backer Burke refuses to comment on it. Max learns a stunning surprise while watching the news. The airplane he was meant to take home crashed soon after takeoff and no one survived, meaning Max is alive because to the phone message. Speaking of phones, Max receives another text instructing him to purchase stock in a business called Sizer, but he chooses to ignore it. Later, when he goes by reception, Max congratulates the staff on the hotel's clever technique of marketing their promotions, but they have no idea what he's talking about. When Max returns to his room, he attempts to contact the phone company to try to find out who sent the message, but their system indicates unknown sender as well. To add to the mystery, the news indicates that Sizer's shares are surging, implying that Max has passed on a great investment opportunity. The following morning, Max receives another text message instructing him to go to Prague, Czech Republic, and this time he chooses to follow. As soon as he steps off of the plane, a Russian taxi driver called Yuri offers to take him into town in his old vehicle. He's aggressive, and Max is cautious, but he accepts since Yuri promises a fixed cost. Yuri is startled to see Max's phone since that model hasn't been officially released yet, and he uses the opportunity to offer him his card because dealing with electronics is his part-time job. Max phones the courier business after he arrives at the hotel, but they aren't authorized to reveal information about senders due to privacy concerns. He then receives another message instructing him to go to the casino and play slot machine number 13, which will strike the jackpot in four more spins. The machine is now in use, but Max is so keen not to lose out on another chance that he pays the current player 100 euros to take it over. The guy walks away, and Max is the next to play, and he wins the jackpot, exactly as the text prophesied. The security crew sees the whole discussion since the casino has surveillance cameras everywhere, and boss John instructs his guys to keep an eye on Max. Next, Max receives a text message instructing him to travel to Blackjack Table 6, where he switches his reward for chips and bets it all, netting him another victory. When John discovers Max staring at his phone while playing, he dispatches one of his security officers to inform him that phones are not permitted in the casino. Not wanting to miss out on this chance, Max phones Yuri to see if he can assist him in finding a means to read the messages without carrying the phone. Yuri agrees to assist, but it will take some time, so Max goes to the hotel, where he discovers a couple arguing in the hallway. Camilla seems to want to flee from a crazy man, and Max defends her, receiving him a blow from the crazy man that knocks him unconscious. When Max is asleep, Camilla reveals the ploy and clones his phone's SIM card before waking up him. With the other man gone, Max takes this opportunity to flirt with Camilla, and the two arrange to meet later. Meanwhile, John's team learns that no trace of Max's communications has been found in any system, which should not be possible. Returning to Max, Yuri installs a Bluetooth text-to-speech transmitter on his phone, enabling Max to enter the casino with just an earphone. Yuri is also pleased by the anonymous messages since they conceal the sender's identity, and Max wonders if he can figure out who sent them, but it demands a level of hacking that Yuri can can only accomplish in Moscow, where he has all of his specialized technology and contacts. Max returns to the casino and wins again by following the instructions in his ear. When John and his guys see this on the security cameras, they chase him through the building. Maxis was ready to go outside when he was stopped by FBI Special Agent Dave, who detained him on the spot. John attempts to stop him, stating Max is their man, but Dave doesn't listen and takes him away, reminding John that he is no longer an agent. Max is then transported to an abandoned warehouse, where Dave questions him about the phone while threatening him with his handgun. Dave trusts Max when he says he doesn't know anything, so he leaves him alone for a time. Following that, 
John arrives at the same building, having utilized his resources to locate Dave. Because John would not go without an explanation, Dave discloses the information he has. They're looking into persons who receive financial advice through text messages. All of the citizens are Americans, although they seem to be chosen at random. The first was a credit bureau official, the second a realtor, and the third the lady from the metro station, who turned out to be an administrator for the Department of Defense. Indeed, one of the communications instructed her to disable the firewalls on the Pentagon systems. The sender is never found, and the recipients cannot be questioned since they all died in mysterious circumstances. They discovered Max ahead of time due to the FBI's collaboration with Burke's unique spying system, which enabled them to intercept the messages. To escape being sent to prison, John and Dave agree to collaborate, and Max joins them. Dave will retain the phone for the night, and Max must not leave the hotel for his own protection. The following day, John goes to visit Mueller, the casino owner, who tells him to employ all available resources to discover the person who is responsible for the messages. Meanwhile, Dave phones Burke, who agrees to have his tracking system operational in three hours. Max is bored at the hotel until he receives a call from Camilla, and they have a drink at the hotel bar while bonding through personal tales. Unfortunately, their date is cut short by John and Dave, who have arrived to pick up Max in order to begin a plot. They've isolated the trace, and now they need three messages for a lock, so Max will have to proceed as normal until it's completed. To do this, John provides Max with some more chips to get him started. Max goes to the casino and bets it all again, but this time he loses and gets a message informing him that this was a warning, if he switches off the phone again, he will be murdered. This seems to be a tragedy, but the messages are sufficient for Burke's men to trace the sender's location to Maryland, USA. However, as soon as Burke learns of this, he instructs everyone to quickly shut down all monitoring equipment and then phones Dave to cancel the mission since the NSA's surveillance program, known as Echelon, seems to be implicated. Dave complies with the instructions and tells Max and John that the grounds for the termination are secret, but John suspects that Echelon is involved. Burke is going insane at the NSA headquarters, demanding to know who broke into Echelon to transmit these messages, but the system shows no unauthorized access. When John notifies Mueller that Dave has departed with the phone and his hypothesis about Echelon, Mueller instructs him to keep a watch on Max. Because he is still alive, this enigmatic organization may approach him again. Max pays a visit to Camilla at her house in the evening, where they discuss their future plans and spend the night together. While Max is preoccupied the next morning, Camilla receives a phone call reminding her to keep Max busy and inside the apartment. Meanwhile, the phone receives a text with an address, so Burke instructs Dave to dispatch an agent posing as Max. Dave doesn't believe they can fool the texter in this way, and he's right. When the agent arrives at his location, he's killed in a vehicle accident caused by someone tampering with the stop lights. Back to Max, he's busy investigating Echelon, a technique that enables the NSA to collect every phone conversation and email exchanged by Americans. The unapproved upgrade would have enabled them to install cameras in everyone's homes. To divert his attention, Camilla becomes loving and cites Omaha, Max's hometown, which he has never told her about. Max is heartbroken when he realizes Camilla is working for someone, but before they can talk, Camilla detects a sniper on a roof across the street and pulls Max to the ground before he is shot. There are also mercenaries climbing the stairs, as seen on Camilla's security video, so she conceals Max in the bathroom while trying to grab the rifle she had placed beneath the kitchen table. This enables the sniper to see her and shoot her in the arm, prompting Camilla to drop the pistol and stab the door with a fire poker before fleeing. The stabbing is effective, and one of the mercenaries is killed. However, the other mercenary survives and hears Max making noise in the toilet. To defend Max, Camilla runs across the apartment, avoiding sniper fire, and rushes on the mercenary to start a battle. The mercenary easily overpowers Camilla, and Max assists her by stabbing the man's leg with a brush. This provides Camilla the opportunity to finally kill the mercenary, but Sniper flees when he hears the police siren coming. Someone else enters the restroom unexpectedly, John, it's who has been working with Camilla all along. Because the flat has been breached, John takes Max out on the street with him. Dave gets the phone and discovers a new message instructing him to locate Max or he would be murdered as well. Max drives away with John in his vehicle, who warns him that they can't simply flee the NSA, therefore they should stay quiet. Max, on the other hand, has an idea. He wants to fly to Moscow and meet Yuri, who may be able to analyze his SIM card. John resists, believing they can't trust just random person, but Max persuades him that Russia has more advanced equipment than the US, and they don't have someplace else to go anyway. Fortunately, 
John has the clone SIM card information that Camilla obtained, and he may request safe flight to Russia from Mueller. Burke's spying apparatus alerts him to their whereabouts as soon as they arrive in Moscow, and he sends Dave to track them down. John and Max pay a visit to Yuri, who insists he knows nothing, after John threatens him and pledges to do the job in three hours. Following that, John and Max go for a stroll across the city, and Max learns why John quit the FBI. He was opposed to Burke's monitoring tactics and said too much. When they return to Yuri's apartment three hours later, they find that it has not been accessed. The communications were transmitted by Echelon itself rather than Echelonto. It knew the flight would crash because it intercepted the fuel analysis. It knew about Sizer's stocks because it read the owner's messages with its stockholders. And everything in the casino it could guess because of the quick way it could count cards and keep track of the moves in the slot machines. The entrance of the FBI abruptly interrupts their talk, so John and Max run flee via the back door and steal a vehicle from a neighbor. This sets off a vehicle pursuit around the city, which concludes when John and Max take a false turn and win themselves trapped in front of a passing train. Fortunately, John is armed, and as soon as Dave gets out of his automobile, John fires and causes the vehicle to explode. Dave hands Max the phone back and says that they need him since Echelon will only speak to him, not even Burke can touch him anymore. The NSA is also aware that Echelon is transmitting communications. Dave claims he's on his side and convinces Max to cooperate. The following mail contains the location of Max's first computer job, so the three takes a flight to Omaha. The location is a converted hangar purchased by a startup looking to lease bandwidth, and Max had always felt it was an odd facility to store servers in. Potential customers didn't like it either, the firm was sold at an auction before it ever started. The location hasn't been recorded since the sale, and they can't locate the current owner. When the FBI arrives, they blow out the front entrance to gain entry to the facility, which is empty save for the servers. Max receives a notification requesting him to authorize BIOS, which would enable the servers to accept outside data. They obtain easy access to the servers thanks to Max's admin password, only to discover them absolutely empty. The group leaves the building, believing they've wasted their time, but another agent arrives with significant news. The building's owner was the realtor who died because he, too, received messages. His credit card was also used to purchase Max's phone. Suspicious, Max returns to the facility and sees that Echelon is leaving its home computer and migrating into these servers, which means Burke no longer has control over it. It explains why Max was picked as well, Echelon needed to relocate, and Max was the only one who had a key. Echelon utilized the lady from the train to reduce the firewalls before leaving the Pentagon. Its strategy is straightforward. Since Congress did not authorize the update, Echelon has relocated so that it can upgrade itself. This structure is just a temporary habitation. It will soon take up residence in every machine on the internet. Dave tells Max to stop, but he receives a message stating don't even attempt it, at which point Max sees Echelon is displaying him bank information since it has held the whole population's money hostage. This explains the final victim, who worked for the country's biggest credit data storage institution. Everyone would lose money if the facility was blown up, so Max starts working on ways to get over the security failsafes and halt the upgrade without incident. Dave phones Burke to give him an update on the issue, but it turns out that Burke doesn't want them to shut down Echelon since it's what he's always wanted, and now he doesn't have to wait for Congress to change their views. He has authorization from the president. Dave and John refuse to obey these commands, so Dave is dismissed, and Burke dispatches the other agents to pursue them. While Dave and John try to defend themselves with the little weapons they have, Max gets an idea when he notices the computer has a camera and a microphone, so he puts on the earpiece and manages to communicate directly to Echelon. Max starts asking questions, and Echelon reveals that its primary mission is to safeguard the national security of the United States, which it describes as a country of individuals with constitutionally guaranteed liberties. Any danger to such freedom must be removed, which implies Max still has options. He does an echelon search for any internet publications that were critical of the update bill. After learning all of this information, echelon concludes that it is a danger to American freedom, and shuts down just as the FBI overpowers Dave and John and arrests everyone. Later, when he is offering inadequate excuses to the president and accepting responsibility for the disaster, Burke will have to testify before the Senate Intelligence Oversight Committee, which will very certainly have his head. When Mueller learns that the matter has been resolved, he rejoices, and Max is soon freed from jail owing to Camilla, who has paid everyone's bail. Nobody will file charges because they do not want the public to know what occurred. With Burke in jeopardy, John contemplates Dave's offer to return to the FBI, while Max reunites with Camilla, who says that Mueller delivered the bail money and has also sent a large check to Max as a thank you. 
Max decides he needs a holiday and invites Camilla to France, which was her dream. At that very time, Max receives a message from Yuri, congratulating him on a job well done. He was still in Moscow, but things were changing for him. He puts on his captain's uniform after shaving and altering his hair to seem neater since he's always been a member of the Russian security service. His supervisor commends him for his activities and points out that they helped the Americans make the proper choice from the start. 